Welcome to ESPN Classics Live, an unprecedented coverage, the implosion of the Seattle Kingdom, less than a half hour away, one day before its 24th birthday, this dome is going down in order to make way for a new tackle football stadium. Time for the whole kingdom to start crumbling. There it is, Seattle, Washington. Kingdom all set to come down. They got the explosive set. It was a little worried earlier because it looked like a slow walk up crowd. It might be blacked out locally like some of those Seahawks games, but instead, it's partly cloudy, cool, perfect day for a walk or a hike or a destruction of a major sports stadium. We have very good video down close to the kingdom just brought back to show you some of the late preparations as uh, we get set here. With us tonight on this blow up of this kingdom, Dave Craig, who almost got the Seahawks to a uh, Super Bowl a few times. Slick Watts, who led the NBA in steals and assists in one season, and Jack Sigma, who did win a title for the Seattle Supersonics 1979. When I said tonight, it's because we got up at like 3 a.m. to beat the crowd here. But we are here, and we welcome you on ESPN Classic, where down close just a few minutes ago, we got some very close and exclusive shots of how the Kingdom area is being prepared. They got a safeguard, the condominiums being taped up there because people live just yards away from that place. They need to be protected, and it looks like uh, things are in order. At least that's certainly the hope. The place is stacked and ready to go approximately 6,000 holes have been packed with close to 4,500 pounds of explosives connected by 21 miles of detonation cord. It's going to go in a couple of phases the way this thing is going to work. You see it on the computer animation. The implosion in two phases collapsing the dome in six pie-like sections. During phase one explosions in three sections will be detonated. Seconds later, phase two detonating the remaining three. The sequence should be about 12 to 20 seconds. The concrete in each rib and the roof and each support column will be fractured. Then the metal rebar remaining intact, forcing the outside to be pulled down with gravity inward toward the center. The structure will then fall inward upon itself. At least that's the way it's supposed to go. I pretty much cheated my way through auto shop, so I don't know what I'm talking about. But that's what the experts tell us. And we are 26 minutes away now from very much uh, different angle. We'll try to show you this thing. That's the inside version you're now looking up at. There'll be a camera inside as this thing goes. I'm not sure about the uh, workability of those cameras afterwards, certainly. There's the long shot of the kingdom. We're getting set as thousands upon thousands of people are getting set to watch this thing. Now, if the kingdom had been a guy, I imagine he'd have been rather unsuccessful with women, but he'd have had a real good attendance record at work and saved a lot in the 401k every week. That is to say, he wasn't much to look at, but he certainly got the job done. We look now at the folks who went to work with him over the last 24 years, the classic moments. from 300. The 2-1 pitch to Randolph. Swung on, ground ball to Cruz. This should do it. He's got it. It's over. Gaylord has 300. Gaylord Perry becomes the 15th man in baseball history to win 300 games. Third and one from the two. Here's Bo. And here goes Bo for the touchdown. He and Bosworth, one on one, and Jackson just jumps him into the end zone. Seattle Mariners, Diego Segui, the first pitch in history as a strike, taken at the knees.
Fazio. His 2-1 pitch on the way. Swung on high jump over the mound. Charged by Vizquel. Barrett throws. It's over. And Fazio has done it. My, oh, my. What a performance by Chris Fazio. Bo Jackson to the 20. Some great, great moments in the kingdom. Left off this voting was the illegal wiffle ball game that I think resulted in an arrest down there. But you, the computer using ESPN.com voting person, voted for the Seattle Mariners. Ken Griffey's son coming in and sliding and smiling and beating the Yankees in 1995. With us right now, guy who played a little bit of football inside that joint, number 17 out of Milton College, which pretty much went away too. Then the kingdom going away. So Dave Craig with the legacy of Knocking out a couple of joints. Look at this, the <laughs> scramble. John L's open. John L is open, and he dumps it to him. Looks like he did most of the work there, Dave. He did most of the work after he caught the pass, but uh, I still scrambled on. That's a lot of fear. <laughs> and you were a long shot to get into this league. Undrafted, unsigned, I think, too. Just kind of showed up in Seattle. But you, you made it. You did well. Then eventually uh, took Jim Zorn's job, who had started the whole thing. And your experiences are vast in that building behind well, us. That brings back a tremendous amount of memories. It's the first opportunity that I got to play pro football, first time I flew on a plane. So it, in a way, it was a beginning, an opportunity for me. Uh, that lasted 19 years playing pro football, thanks to the city of Seattle and to that little building over there, the Kingdom. And uh, it's the end of an era for a lot of people, the folks that work there, uh, fans, all the people that work for the Seahawks, and, and the players that uh, started and ended their careers there. What's your biggest thrills? Are the relationships? I mean, you played with Kenny Easley. You threw to Steve Largy. You played with Jim Zorn, all these guys. You know? Those are the things that I remember the most, playing with some great football players, Steve Large and Kenny Easley, Kurt Warner, uh, on and on and on, uh, just uh, and playing against the other teams. I mean, when I first got here, I thought, what a great seat. I'm on the sideline. I get to see all the players that I used to watch and uh, make some of the plays that we had there. Paul Scanzi, I mean, made some big plays. So Third down it's, guy. It's the camaraderie. And you almost made a Super Bowl. We almost made a Super Bowl. We beat the Raiders twice. I mean, I remember all the remember the Raider haters and the Raider weeks and all that. So uh, all those memories are going to kind of go down. I'm sure they'll start anew, but they'll never be the same as the Kingdom. Were you glad you weren't the opposing quarterback? Because that was a very loud play. Well, I think when we hear this thing implode, um, we're going to hear the sounds reverberating through like all the visiting teams had coming in here because the wave originated here, and this is kind of like the Kingdom's giving its final wave. All right, Dave, stay around. We're going to be watching this thing live as the Kingdom comes down. We'll hear more from you a bit later in the show. Dave Craig along, and the Sonics coming back. Right now we're looking at the Kingdom. 21 minutes, 45 seconds until that structure hits the floor. Coming up, some Seattle Mariners looking back at a very, very scary night in the kingdom. Edgar Martinez, home run. It was one game that, um, that was an earthquake. We were sitting at the uh, dugout, and it was shaking. The whole dugout was shaking, and we were looking at each other like, what's going on? We thought it was the uh, moose. At first, I think we all thought the Mariner moose was jumping on our dugout. And then when you stop and see the moose jumping off the dugout and knowing that he was jumping off the visiting team's dugout, that, that's when I think it all kind of hit home. This is ESPN Classic, the Classic Sports Network. That there, the harbor right outside of the Kingdom. A lot of boats in this town, but I have never seen so many assemble in one place at one time. They're here for one thing and one thing only, to hear the Aunt Kate story, which is coming up real soon in this TV show. But right now we got PI columnist Art Teal in a very strange spot. He shouldn't be this close, but we're happy to be near him to get his summary of what's about to occur. Hi, Kenny. I'm inside the Blast Zone about five floors up from McCrory's Restaurant, which is hosting about 400 people from the neighborhood today to get them out of the way of the implosion. We're about 200 yards from the Kingdom here. You can't get much closer unless you're a cop or a rat. That's about all that's left down here, some security personnel, some workers. It's the quiet before the doom. We're here to celebrate the end of a building built for a thousand years but lasted only 24. It wasn't the Kingdom that failed. It was the people. The Seahawks and Mariners, they said it was inadequate. In fact, its only flaw was it failed to make rich people richer. 
So despite the fact that it hosted four professional sports teams, the only building in the world to do so, and hosted everyone from Billy Graham to Mick Jagger, Seattle has decided it no longer needs a nine-acre roof in a marine climate. Kenny, it doesn't get any dumber. Art Teal in kind of a dark mood as 17 minutes, 35 seconds remain until the kingdom goes down. The people of Seattle still gathering, coming up the hills, many hills looking down here toward the kingdom, and they are set to watch the Seattle kingdom go goodbye. Those of you who like to watch ESPN2 remember an Aunt Kate feature. Well, that's coming up later in the show. Her views on the kingdom going down coming up later on ESPN Classic. They might have considered paying for that damn thing before they blew it up. You can bet they won't be inviting my fat ass in one of those suites. Looks like the Olympic Mountains in the distance of Seattle. Hikers can look back and see the implosion as well. They're getting set 15 minutes away from the implosion of the Seattle Kingdom. We've been reliving all the great sporting moments, all the stories that people have shared inside that kingdom, but there's also been some tragic and near tragedy as we hear in this Sports Center flashback. The huge ceiling tile fell into the stands behind home plate as the Orioles and the Mariners were taking batting practice before the game. No one was injured because the fans were not yet in the park. This is a four by six tile weighing 25 pounds. Randy Johnson said he had a pretty good view of it. The kingdom was caving in and we saw it fall right back here about uh, 10 rows back and it would have taken out, it took out two rows. And there's another piece up that looks like it's getting ready to fall too. So it's just a matter of time for the whole kingdom to start crumbling. Seattle Mariners infielder Mike Blowers has a few buddies who are Kingdom employees. They have told him they would be very surprised if the team is able to play at home before September. Officials in Seattle have decided to replace all the tiles from the Kingdom roof. They don't know how long that will take. The inconvenience and aesthetic annoyance of the Seattle Kingdom was replaced by true tragedy last night. Two workers trying to repair the problem-riddled ceiling of the dome fell 250 feet to their deaths when a basket atop a construction crane broke loose. The basket struck the cab of the crane, seriously injuring a third worker. Work to repair the roof and the falling acoustic tiles, which have been going on around the clock, was immediately halted indefinitely. Two painters were at work on a freshly sandblasted section of the roof when part of the crane holding their basket collapsed. The deaths are being ascribed to an industrial accident, possibly a failed cable. The state plans a full investigation. At about 9 o'clock Pacific time, the entire city of Seattle, including the Kingdome, and its game between the Mariners and Indians was struck by a fairly significant earthquake. The fans and players at the park were in the midst of a pitching change in the seventh inning when what was described as a gentle, repeated roll overtook the building, and the fans heard this. We have experienced an earthquake. Please remain calm and in your seats. The building is safe. The crowd was not huge, but those who were there acted like seasoned earthquake veterans. Mike Hargrove, Lou Pinella discussing the situation with stadium officials. The players looked on. Ken Griffey Jr. said he thought he was having a dizzy spell. At first, I think we all thought the Mariner Moose was jumping on our dugout, really and truly. Uh, and, then when you, and then when you stop and see the Moose jumping off the dugout and knowing that he was jumping off the visiting team's dugout, that, that's when I think it all kind of hit home. I remember feeling the earthquake, and I said uh, to my producer, I said, we're having an earthquake. I'm getting out of here. I got up and left the microphone. Uh, the speaker swaying back and forth, and then basically everybody getting the heck off the field, getting underneath the dugout. Uh, and then hearing Dave Niehaus saying, I'm out of here, and then listening to him when, from his car going across the floating bridge. I didn't know that uh, had there been a real serious earthquake there, uh, the kingdom was to have been used as a place to go in case of an earthquake. In all over the 24 years, there were five deaths associated with accidents at the kingdom. Today's event, quite a spectacle, people gathering to watch this thing, and there's been some comedy involved in it as well. But we can't know all the emotions those families of the victims and those deaths uh, are sharing today. But we do respect them uh, as they watch the kingdom uh, and the implosion as well in Seattle today. We're coming back right away with the Seattle Supersonics looking at the implosion of the kingdom. Ken Griffey's son certainly was the superstar of the Seattle Kingdom era. He's now a Cincinnati Red. You'll hear from him later, but first his old teammate and our colleague, Harold Reynolds, on his greatest remembrance.
Number one on my list is probably the Bo Jackson play. I was on first base and Scott Bradley hits a ball into the corner and I'm going full speed. I look out in the left field, the ball's going in the corner, I'm already around a second, I get to third, I'm like, game over. I'm in full force. The next thing you know, I see whoever's the, the next hitter telling me to slide and I'm thinking he's joking. So I slide, just a courtesy slide. The catcher tags me and I'm out and I hop up in total disbelief. I can't believe what happened. Well, I see the replay later and I, I see that Bo reached down and caught the ball and threw it all the way in the air and threw me out. Uh, a lot of memorable memories in the kingdom. It was, it was a, a great place for me and it's sad to see this thing getting blown up. Crowd starting to get amped up because we are eight minutes, 30 seconds away from the implosion of the Seattle Kingdom. Although I gotta believe there are some folks among the crowd not exactly excited to see this day occur. Right now, we're bringing in a couple of guys, superstars in the Seattle area. First, Slick Watts, really, first guy to really be popularized in this city with the Seattle Supersonics, the trademark headband, led the league in assists and steals in one season. Then there's Jack Sigma had that patented fallaway jumper that led the Seattle Sonics to their one and only title back in 1979. Thanks for being here and being a part of this. And I see you wore the headband and the funeral suit. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's a very emotional moment for me because uh, I had a chance to be introduced in front of 60,000 people to open up the kingdom and just to get an opportunity to, to play in front of millions of people was very exciting. And uh, to see it go down, my son played here. My, my wife cheerleaded here, so it's a very emotional moment for me. Jack, you won the title on the Bullets court. They're now the Wizards, but you certainly built the team in this very building. Yes, it was uh, that first season when we, uh, we had uh, lost in the seventh game the year before and got a chance to play the Bullets again. And uh, Seattle had taken to the Sonics. We were averaged, I think, over 20,000 people a game. There were some nights where there was 40,000 people. There really were some cheap seats up top. I think people were able to get in for three bucks and they'd fill them on those big playoff games. It was a great atmosphere. Have you talked to any of the old guys, Gus Williams, DJ, Fred Brown, any of the guys about this place going down? Have you had any of those conversations? Well, I, I uh, we talk about the kingdom. We remember some of those uh, games you come out and there wasn't a lot of people there and uh, it was almost as cold as it is this morning <laughs> inside the kingdom. But it I, worked. It worked. Uh, when, when we had a lot of people, it was fantastic. It was, there was some times when uh, we only drew four or 5,000 people. It was awfully cold and um, wasn't the best environment for basketball. And I think everyone's happy to be back at Key Arena now, but uh, it sure served a, uh, us really well for those seven years. Now, Slick, you're a guy who got the crowd excited, played low to the floor, but there's some weird shooting sights in that place, right? With the backdrop, it wasn't the easiest place to play basketball. Well, I always thought sometimes you shoot the wind would blow the ball in. <laughs> <laughs> it was a tough place to play because of the, the distance you had to look so far. What, what's your strongest memory? Was there a particular, particular night, particular game? Um, my strongest memory was uh, we, we played uh, Milwaukee in a game. It's actually the year after we won the championship, and there was, I think, the biggest crowd ever. There was 40-some thousand people there. And uh, we laid a brick. We played terrible. We lost the game with all those screaming people. We drew them in. How about you? So, like, you came back after being traded away from the Sun. Well, that's was a strong memory for me, coming back and play, playing Jack and uh, going to the hole on Jack and having him throw me out there, <laughs> coming in, <laughs> knocking me down a few times. And, but it was always good to come back home and play in front of 40,000 people. All right. Let's check out the kingdom for, for one of the final times. You guys are going to be around to see this thing go away in just a matter of minutes after the commercial. Five minutes, 24 seconds is what I see. We're going to be joined up by the folks from Sports Center to see this thing implode. We're coming right back on ESPN Classic. We are back on ESPN Classic. As you see, three minutes and change until the Seattle Kingdom goes down. The implosion device is all set to go, and we're just going to pause for effect here and let Sports Center join us. Welcome, Sports Center viewers. We are two minutes, 53 seconds away from the implosion of the Seattle Kingdom. We're on ESPN Classic and ESPN all at once. Who knows what ESPN2 and ESPN News are doing? They're on their own. But we're going to watch this thing go down in a matter of minutes right now. 
many great moments in the Seattle Kingdom and sports. Narrowed it down to a couple because you, the computer using ESPN.com voter, voted. You think Ken Griffey was the big moment? Let's see. No balls and a strike to Martinez. Line drive. We are tied. Griffin is coming around. And the court is burning. He's going to try to score. Here's the division championship. No one has won it. No one has won it. Third and one from the two. Here's Bo. And here goes Bo for the touchdown. He and Bosworth one on one, and Jackson just shoves him into the end zone. I suggest a handicap of 18. How about 20 pounds? Bo Jackson could play. Dave Craig, the quarterback, Slick Watts, the guard, Jack Sicka, center forward, and a champion here in Seattle. Any last uh, ways you want to say goodbye to this thing? I mean, you, you had a big career in that joint. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's a big building, and uh, there's a lot of big moments for myself, and a great opportunity, and uh, I guess it's time to put it to rest. Slick. You made this your home, came back here even after getting traded away. I know, I know your family's played in there. You know, your whole life has really been in Seattle sports. Well, I tell you, I'm, I'm going to miss it a lot. And um, I'm looking forward to it going down, but I'm definitely going to miss it. Jack, you won a title. So the only title winner among us here, uh, well, certainly, I, I mean, wiffle ball, certainly. But yeah, there was a lot of people involved, you know, both the in inside the team and uh, uh, all the people the support staff and so forth but there was a ton of fans that came and watched us play in that that building and screaming and yelling it took a lot to make the noise uh, you know it's a big open area and uh, uh, I just remember the people and the screaming and yelling it was, it's very very good memories we just have like half a minute till we're, we're going to sit back and see what happens here but but any any last thoughts of are, are you sad at all or is, or is this kind of like oh well you know progress new stadium. Well, I think the echoes of uh, what happened inside the kingdom, the fans, the wave, I think they'll reverberate all the way through the future. I think it'll be something that'll still be here. And in a few seconds, we're going to hear what it sounded like inside the kingdom. How about you, Slick? Well, the emptiness um, always, you know, the money always prevail, and, uh, and it's time to put, put up a new building. We talked about it in the car with my, my sons, and it's a little sad, but uh, you know it's time to move on. Looking forward to the new stadium, and you know, uh, I know Safeco Field's a wonderful right, place. Right now, I'm sorry to cut you off, but we're going to sit back and hear the countdown we expect at any moment. Keep in mind, this is experimental for us. Earl, are you clear? Clear. Devin, are you clear? Clear. Clear. Doing the last checks before they give the go. Jamie, are you clear? Clear. Jesse, are you clear? Doug, are you clear? Clear. For the record, this Jamie, is my first implosion. Kevin, are you clear? Clear. Jimmy, are you clear? Clear. Will, are you clear? Clear. Chaos, are you clear? Clear. Oh, we're in a delay then. That's some replay. Guys, that was a good practice. I was kind of amped up, like clear, clear, let's let's hit the thing. All right, let's start over then. Let's give them the, one minute, guys. So we're off time just a bit. But you know, the thing is that they have to take the extra precautions. The, the whole city, they had a, the whole zone there, as you look back, several blocks going back where they weren't allowing cars, weren't allowing people. So obviously safety, uh, a, a good thing to consider. Delay right a here. game, huh? <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to hold it against him, but uh, certainly I think the ESPN Sports Center fans are waiting for the late Predator score, wondering what's going on right now. But <laughs> hey, this is an implosion. It's a one of a kind thing here and, and making way for a new stadium, which have you seen the plans for that thing yet? No, I haven't seen the plans yet, but I do, do know one thing. It's going to be an uh, open air stadium. I'm not sure about that with this kind of weather. All right, let's try again. Take two, implosion of the Seattle Kingdom. Here we go, CDI. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6.
Well, that's certainly uh, something you don't see every day. I think we're just awestruck, kind of. Something amazing. A uh, reminder to Seattle uh, parents, youth soccer has been canceled at the Kingdom <laughs> for this week. Wow. Just like that. Let's see it again, okay? This is uh, what just happened. If you just joined in to Seattle, the Kingdom just went down. <laughs> And this was the look. It's like animated. We're going to see it from inside now. I don't think the camera exists anymore. Side view first, I guess. This is inside right here. Wow, the camera, the camera failed. Guys, <laughs> thanks for being a part of this. You'll stay with us on ESPN Classic, but ESPN Sports Center gonna carry on with, with normal sports, all the buildings that are still uh, in place. Please, while we have your attention, note that ESPN Classic will be presenting a 26 hour marathon NCAA championships They'll make it look like old grainy film for more authenticity. Please watch that on Sunday, April 2nd. The Seattle Kingdom, one day shy of its 24th birthday. It is history. Pele played there. Barry Sanders played there. Dave Craig played there. Sickman Watts. Back to you, Sports Center. How'd you guys uh, like getting thrown in with Pele? I mean, that's good company. Uh, very good. You people on ESPN Classic, stay with us. Some more fun uh, remembrances of the kingdom. Some folks who played in there. Dave Craig, Jack Sigma, Slick Watts going to stay with us all show long. Going to see this thing one more time before we go to break. Also known as break. I, my, my speech has been affected at this point. I got shook. Guy who will not play right field in that building anymore, Jay Buhner. He looks back at one of his fondest memories. Scary memory. I think the things that uh, that really will always stand out in my mind, obviously, will be uh, the, the special 95 season, the September to remember run. But I think there will always be um, you know, memories, of course, and there will always be like flashbacks and uh, little things that uh, remind you of, of the past. But that's a great thing about memories. I mean, I'll, you'll always have those. I'll always remember that. Uh, I have plenty of pictures to remind me of, uh, of the kingdom and a piece of tile, so I'll always remember that. Will this be the final pitch thrown here in the kingdom? The 2 2. On the way to Rusty Greer, swinging a fly ball into left center field. Brian Hunter, it will be. He's got it. The ball game is over. Seattle, Washington, the aftermath of the implosion of the Seattle Kingdom, the dust still settling, and the hope is that it didn't settle over on Safeco Field because they got to play a baseball game there. And in fact, Safeco Field, the site of an ESPN baseball game, Red Sox, Mariners, baseball music, Tuesday, April 4th, baseball season's coming back, 8 Eastern, but so we don't show our East Coast bias, 5 Pacific. So then, it would appear that every quarter century or so, the people of Seattle demolish a pro sports structure. The Kingdom Rubble will be the foundation for a new tackle football stadium, a cross town where the Pilots used to play before they were stolen to become the Brewers. Sixth Stadium was leveled in 1974, and Seattle got an Eagle hardware store. It's a nice store. Lumber, can you please dial station 302, please? Lumber 302, kitchen and bath. 
Hi, I'm wearing a different shirt. This is Steve McCulley, and that's Matt McCulley. Their brother Mike couldn't be here. We used to go to Pilots games together back in the olden days, 1969. The Pilots' first season had many memorable moments, too many to chronicle here, but they gave their fans plenty to yell about and then some. I bet we went to 20 or 30 games. You no, know, no, and we were going to go to a lot more the next year until all of a sudden <laughs> they went down to spring training and never came back. And then we had nothing, so I became a Reds fan. What pilot came from the Reds? Tommy Harper. Tommy Harper? Every time he got on base, it wouldn't matter if the score was 15 to nothing or if he, the bases were loaded, all the fans would go, 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 <laughs> go, go, because I mean, we had did. so little. And you know what? We didn't care about being last place because we had a Major League Baseball team. Whatever the future holds, divisional championships, World Series, All-Star games, even these would be hard put to match the year that was. Go, go, pilots, you from Seattle. After every game, they'd put the song on, and they'd have a little 45, you know, and you could hear them. We'd get done losing 10 to nothing, and then we'd hear, go, go, you pilot, you pilot, your proud Seattle team. And we would go, yeah, we're real proud. This is left field, then. Roughly. Yeah. Do you want to play? Hey, better, 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 better. That's the ball. That was some meat. He yeah. came, right? He's finished. He can't see. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> There's a forklift in center field. Deep, it's gone! Woo! Woo! We can probably put that back. You can take anything back to Nordstrom. Oh, yeah, that's fine, I think. Who was your favorite player? Uh, I think I'd have to say Tommy Harper. That was, all he was my favorite player, OK, too. then I'm going to have to say uh, Gene Brabender. Tommy Davis. Jim Bouton. Uh, you know, went on to write a book about the whole thing. The next most famous guy was Mike Marshall. Joe Schultz was the manager. He swore a lot. How yeah. <laughs> about Wayne Comer in Wayne, center field? Yeah. Steve Hoadley. Mike Hegan. Jim Pagliaroni. Pagliaroni. Yeah. Rich Rollins. Larry Haney. Gary Bell. Who was the starting lineup? Diego Segui, Diego Gary Segui, Bell. Diego also started for the Mariners. Right? First he threw the first pitch for both teams. Both and then we're talking about how all my life's a circle, you know, then David Segui. Right. Right from there is Lou Pinella, and now he's the... Uh... So the Pilots begat the Mariners, Ken Griffey begat Ken Griffey Jr., and all was well, except the Mariners lost a lot. Kenneth began his Northwest playing days in the rain. A ball, Bellingham, Washington. I saw him drop a fly ball once. But he got real good, and so did Seattle baseball, a near title run back in 1995. Now he's a red like his dad was and is, and the commish, Peter Gammons, received an audience with Seattle's departed star. long time in Seattle, have a lot of friends there. You know, Melissa's from there. I mean, is this something you'd like to say to the people of Seattle? You know, everybody tried to blame, you know, the Mariners tried to blame me, tried to paint me in a bad situation. Um, there's no hard feelings. Um, just an opportunity where, you know, I felt, you know, for myself that a time change for the for the best would be now and I can go somewhere that's closer to my family. I can do the things that I want to do. What's your fondest memory of your years in Seattle? I got to play with my dad. You know, and nobody else can say that. You know, I got to run out on the field and do the game that we both love to do, work at the same place at the same time, and look at him and go, hi, Dad. Jim Bowden said that he found it a little bit insulting that people have suggested that part of this deal is that you're assuring that your father manages the team. It is insulting. I mean, anybody, do you think my dad would say, you know, quote unquote, I took a pay cut, you know, for him to be a manager? He wouldn't allow that. I mean, that that's his whole thing. He's like, I want you to be happy, but don't be happy because of me. I'm going to be all right for them to think that I came to Cincinnati for my dad to be the manager. That's not true. In 1995, you told me if you went somewhere else, you, you thought I, you would end up in Cincinnati. Did you really believe that? Well, it's the one place where I, every kid, you know, who grew up in Cincinnati wanted to play. And, you know, I, I tell everybody, I mean, it's just, 
it's a childhood dream to play in front of your hometown. No matter where you're at, you want to play for them. You look good in red? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And the thing was, Ken Griffey Jr. liked that building, but he's a Cincinnati Red now. It's all over, and you can get pieces of the rubble by going down there on alternate Saturdays or something coming up. I'm not making that up. Dave Niehaus, the great radio caller of the Seattle Mariners, he looks back at his kingdom memories now. Really, my favorite memory is the first game there. Almost 60,000 fans were there. Frank Tanana uh, shut us out the first night. Nolan Ryan shut us out the second night. And I was beginning to wonder not only if we'd win a game in 1977, but if we'd score a run. And, but there are so many uh, memories. Uh, and, and I'm sure that there will be times uh, that uh, stories will be embellished about what happened in the kingdom. I'm sure that there will be many great feats that never happened there, really happened in the minds of a lot of people. Seventy three million one hundred thirty thousand four hundred thirty three customers and not one more will enter the Seattle Kingdom. It has been imploded. It was successful to our knowledge. It sure looks like it's down, but they'll be checking out collateral damage down there. Kingdom's done. We would like to thank individually those viewers who used to watch Sports Night on ESPN2. Those were simpler times. A staple of that program was Aunt Kate and she's back with us on this historic day. They might have considered paying for that damn thing before they blew it up. I figured it would have went down during the WTO convention anyway. What's this TV story for anyway? A big blob of cement falling down? Listen, Buster, I had three cakes fall last week. I had to pay full retail to save my ass at the senior center. And I didn't see any TV newsboys going live in my kitchen. And if you ask me, that old barn is a little wet behind the ears anyway. I got all of them myths older than the kingdom. What do you think? The Greeks did the original labor on it? I think it's one more team getting one more stadium just so some fancy pants people can make more money off of each other. These are the same people that pulls off their computers on airplanes just to show off. You can bet they won't be inviting my fat ass in one of those suites. And the new joint will have all those high flutin' extras. Ooh. In my day, we suffered to watch tackle football. Football is minus 70 windshield, a little nip off of Grandma's special thermos, and a big dopey number 75 pancaking a sissy cornerback. Booyah, Stuart Scott, you all. I may be old as dirt, but I'm still breaking off something proper. So how long till the new building gets steamrolled? And who's footing the bill for all this? Me. I'm scraping couch cushion change. Every Wednesday for lotto and I know they're skimming off the top. I'll give them some credit, though. They got half a clue on this destruction plan. Tear the roof off the sucker, that's what I say. Give me some breathing room or I'll go spree well on you all. Aunt Kate wouldn't have liked this. She's somewhere, I think she watched it on TV, the Seattle Kingdom, all done after nearly 24 years of good service. Our guy Harold Reynolds played some ball in there, turned some double plays, broke up no hitters, and he has a very peculiar remembrance. Probably one of the funniest stories, the Seahawks had a function there, a big fundraiser dinner at the Dome. So we're all in our suits and we go there, and some guy pulls up next to us, and, and we're standing by the valet park and waiting for our car, and the guy pulls up next to us, flips me his keys and says, park it. <laughs> I catch his keys, and I'm like, okay, I got your park it. And I take his car and park it like way over in the lot, in the north lot, and I leave it running. <laughs> That there, the aftermath of the Seattle Kingdom to the floor. Still got to cart that stuff away. And then it will be the foundation for the new stadium where the Seahawks and some soccer ready for action in 2002. Until then, the Seahawks are going to be playing out at Husky Stadium where all those boats pull up and watch games. They were here to watch this thing be imploded. John Clayton, who used to cover the Seahawks, now works for ESPN, has his remembrance. 
the Kingdome was probably the noisiest place in the National Football League, and you knew that when you would go to the owners' meeting, because what would happen is that people would try to change the rules, and it was because of the dome stadiums, but particularly the Kingdome, because what would happen is quarterbacks would have to come in there and use a silent count. John Elway was probably more affected in the Kingdome than just about any place else. A lot of times he would call timeouts, the crowd would get louder, there would be false starts, mistakes, and the next thing you knew, John Elway was throwing an interception. Crowd noise would get into the 100 decibel levels and it would get so loud that even the people would be sitting next to you in the press box, you couldn't hear a word they were saying. The kingdom was a place when the crowd was there and the crowd was excited. It was an exciting place to be. Yeah, it was, Dave. I mean, we talked about it just a bit earlier, but remember those games? I remember some Raider games in particular, mid 80s. I mean, it was so loud. You almost felt bad for the other quarterback. I'm sure you didn't, though. I didn't feel bad, but I did have the like the chicken skin, the goosebumps. You know, yeah. standing on the sideline, you could just hear the fans, and they were part of the team too, the 12th man, and it was just uh, uh, fond memories of that. And then when the kingdom went down just now, it was like, man, it's over with, it's done, and it's just sitting back there, and it's like all the blood, sweat, and tears, the hard work and effort, it's just it's gone, just like that. Some of the guys, I mean, really deserve special standout notice. Jim Zorn started that thing, he and Steve Large, and all those crazy plays with Efren Herrera, and then the Seahawks were sort of a novelty. Right. Then they got good. Yeah, then we got real good. We, when Chuck Knox came in here, he would have liked that. A whole bunch of explosions and a cloud of dust. <laughs> and another guy we need to remember is uh, Pete Gross. Absolutely. You know, in the Nordstrom's for, for starting this whole thing off. So. Pete Gross, go ahead and tell that yeah, story. Yeah, Pete Gross is, uh, was a great man. He was the announcer of the Seahawks, the voice of the Seahawks, and, and he passed away a couple years ago, but uh, his memory still lives on. Uh, he was a big factor in all that we did because we, uh, we just really remember him. He's a very special person. Now, I grew up in this area, and in my little pathetic existence, I actually got to throw a couple passes to Steve Largent <laughs> in my life. You got to throw some real one. What a real that was. I threw a bunch of passes to Steve Largent. I remember you also being in the locker room when you started off your career, and, and look where you ended up. But I had a great opportunity to throw to a, a Hall of Famer and Steve Largent and, and many other players. Steve was one that happened to make it pretty big. But there was a lot of other tackle football players that I played <laughs> with that, uh, that were just as enjoyable. I think I noticed all three of us. We're going to wrap up in a minute with everybody, but it was just a little bit of a sense of loss here. Everybody was their mouth open, like, wow. That it really was. And the people that came here to watch it, I mean, sure, they were fans and everything, but I mean, the athletes that played inside that building, we know, and it's like, it's gone. They took our gym away, you know, yeah. and, and uh, we can't play in there anymore, but the memories are still there, and, and life goes on. It's just like that. Progress. All right, stay around. We're going to wrap up with, with all the athletes here, coming right back to. Uh, the kingdom or what's left of it, we're right above it. Seattle Kingdom, it's done. That was different. The Seattle Kingdom is history. And Jack, you, you and I kind of exactly had the same thought. It looked like a computer animation, didn't it not? Yeah, it's uh, surreal. And you see it on TV, on tape, but, uh, you know, slow motion, the whole deal. Now, I, when it happened, just for the record, I remember Dave kind of just turned. Both of you stood up like it, it was kind of, you were in awe of the whole thing, were you not? You know, th uh, three years to build, three seconds to explode. I can not believe that, <laughs> I'll tell you. Are you a little uh, sad right now? Before it's like, okay, you know, we had our moments, um, but but when you really see it go, I mean, it was like, you know, you felt some hurt almost. You know, if that building had feelings, oh, trees exactly. have feelings, I think. Exactly. I mean, I think we all had the same memories, and then now it's just sitting there, a pile of rubble, and uh, there's a lot of memories in that building, and uh, it's kind of sad. I, I think though, if you were a player, knowing what you're going to get next. I guess it just depends on, on everybody has the different viewpoint. It's always from your perspective. You knew you were going to get this big fancy new place and it was going to be something different. Maybe that's something to look forward to instead, too. Well, I don't know about that because we're not going to get to look forward to it. <laughs> get to watch. Get you know, to watch, yeah. yeah. Was it the greatest implosion you've been involved in? I mean, how do you compare it on your implosion <laughs> scale? I put it top of my list. I'm uh, <laughs> wondering uh, what's the early early line at 25 years from now, which one goes then? So well, I don't know which building is next. Like I say, every <laughs> quarter century, something seems to go down. You were saying earlier, you know, you're a big golf developer, Jack Sigma. It looked like a nice spot for uh, for 18 hole, at least nine. Yeah, it is. It's a good location. You know, location, location, location. <laughs> Get uh, all the city dwellers uh, to come right down. It's a 
pretty expensive piece of real estate there. Any last goodbyes? Do you want to say goodbye in some special way, or have you said your goodbyes? I've said my, it's pretty nostalgic and it's sad, but you know, life goes on, and um, that's just the way it is. Slick, I'm gonna miss watching that big old round spot there. It's gonna be a different view, is it not? Yep. Yep. It looks pretty permanent. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jack Sigma, Slick Watts, Dave Craig, thank you so much for being a part of this. A very different experience on ESPN Classic and ESPN. So, the building where Pele played, the building where all these guys played, where uh, Walter Payton played, where Michael Jordan played, where the King Kareem Abdul-Jabbar played, where Ken Griffey's son and Ken Griffey played, it is over, and our show is over as well. Thanks so much for being a part of ESPN Classic special coverage. We'll see you at the next implosion, or as my pal Stuart Scott would say, the next time an athlete is blowing up.